So we've been talking about the history of the form, the importance of story and craft and collaboration, but where does the story come from in the first place that you're going, that you're going to write? And, and that leads us to the, the debate about should you be writing original musicals or should you be adapting? Um, there's no right answer to that. But in this room, we do concentrate on adaptation. We always give you source material to work from in different forms, plays, screenplays, short stories, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean that you can't or shouldn't write an original musical at some point in your life, but you won't be doing it this year in this room, just so you know. Um, but that being said, you can bring a huge amount of originality to your adaptations. We do not require you to do, there are many different kinds, right? You can do a really faithful adaptation. Um, this art form, the musical theater art form, has always embraced adaptation. If you look at the lists of Tony Awards over the years, the, the instances of original musicals are few and far between. They're almost always, probably 80 to 90 percent of them are adaptations. Um, so, I, I, in fact, I went and I looked. I, I wanted to see what was on Broadway right before COVID, so the 2018-19 season, what was on Broadway. There were a bunch of musicals based on movies, Beetlejuice, Moulin Rouge, Pretty Woman, Tootsie, Frozen, Mean Girls, The Lion King, all of those based on movies. There were musicals that were from the existing songbooks of artists, like Hades Town, that was based on the 2010 folk opera concept album by Anais Mitchell, and Jagged Little Pill, which was inspired by a 1995 album by Alanis Morissette. Um, and, and when we look at what's reopening now, now that things are finally starting to open up, what's coming back? The things that are opening that are from the movies, um, Aladdin, The Lion King, Moulin Rouge, from songbooks, we're getting Hades Town and Jagged Little Pill back. Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations, which tells the story of that Motown group. Tina, the Tina Turner musical. And then reopening from previous really long runs, uh, we have Chicago, which interestingly is a revival of the 1975 musical, which was based on a 1926 play. We have Come From Away, which although there's a lot of originality in that piece, it is based on interviews with real people in Newfoundland who went through this experience and, and the people from the plains. Uh, there's Hamilton, which is based on a book, as Lin-Manuel is always talking about that book and how he fell in love with it. Phantom of the Opera is based on a French novel. Wicked is based on a novel. The Book of Mormon is largely original. That's one in there that is primarily an original story. Um, but on the other hand, bear in mind that it was written by Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who were already pretty famous at the time for South Park. So it's not like they were unknown writers who got their original material on Broadway. It didn't quite work that way. Dear Evan Hansen is also largely uh, original. It's based on an incident that ha apparently happened in the life of one of the writers, Benj Pasek, Benj Pasek, but otherwise it's largely original. So there's an example. The new shows that are opening up. This, that, that aren't, you know, that weren't already running or, um, or coming from a long run. Girl from the North Country, which is a Bob Dylan songbook. MJ, a new musical adapted by, uh, about the life of Michael Jackson. Mrs. Doubtfire from the movie. Diana, which is about, you know, Princess Diana and largely it's a biography, it's based on her life. But then there is an original new musical called Flying Over Sunset that's opening. But again, bear in mind, the music is written by Tony and Pulitzer Prize winner Tom Kitt, who wrote the music for Next to Normal. So again, not exactly an unknown team getting the original musical on Broadway. But, a little bit of hope, Six is opening. Six is a pop musical about the wives of Henry VIII, and it was originally presented by Cambridge University students at the Edinburgh Fringe. And now it's on Broadway. So, there are exceptions here and there, but you can see that largely these things are adaptations. Why is that? Why do we see so many adaptations? I think primarily it's because the, the musical has so many moving parts. You know, when you're trying to deal with the book, the lyrics, and the music all working together, um, if you start with an existing proven storyline, it's just one less thing to have to worry about with all these moving parts. So it's not impossible to write an original story, it's just a lot harder to make sure that everything is going to work together. And it can speed up what is often a very lengthy process. You can get there quicker if you're starting out with a proven structure. Now, bearing in mind, adaptation does not always mean faithful adaptation. It can also mean a complete reimagining. So for instance, Romeo and Juliet becoming West Side Story. It's not a faithful adaptation, but we can see the parallels. Um, it's, it is also possible to use a structure simply as a structure without any intention of your audience being able to recognize the source. 
So if you're really determined to write an original music, mu musical and or you can't get the rights to something you want to write, if you can find something that you really like out there and use the elements of how the story is told and adapt them to your own story, then you can get the benefit of the structure without actually adapting the piece and not even telling anybody that's what it is. So that's one way, to, one way to get around it. If you are desperate to tell an original story, look for something that you can base your structure on. It, how, what kind of an adaptation you write depends a lot on, on whether you're trying to capitalize on the popularity of the source material or whether you, uh, whether you want to bring a new approach, like take an old thing and, and reimagine it, or whether you w just want to use the structure to guide you. Uh, so obviously from that list I was reading, many, many musicals these days are adapted from really popular movies. Uh, and I hear uh, oftentimes in this room, I hear people complaining and saying, ah, oh, damn it, everything's from a movie, there's no creativity involved, they just take a movie and change it. And I want to say that you really, if you look back at the history of the Broadway musical, you will discover that adaptations have always been there. It used to be more popular to, the, the way to do it used to be to adapt a popular play. Now the way to do it is to adapt a popular movie. There's nothing inherently different about those two things. They're taking a piece of art that has become very popular in the world and musicalizing it. In, in, in the old days, plays were the things that became popular. Nowadays, movies are the things that become more popular. Plays too sometimes, so you still will find things based on plays, but more often movies. So it's not, it's not anything new or anything to lament. Um, to me, the bigger question is, is it a good adaptation or not? Um, I think that some of the movie musicals that they've, some of the musicals that have been made for movies are really good and some of them not so much. And I think the same thing is true of the jukebox musical, the idea of taking someone's songbook and turning it into a show. Some of them are really good, some of them not so much. To me, what determines the difference between whether they work or not is the craft and ingenuity of the team that is executing the adaptation. Because clearly it's not the source material, if that's already popular. So I think that, uh, that for instance, a, um, a writing team that takes a popular movie and simply sticks some songs in it is less likely to succeed. Because they're not bringing anything new. They're not bringing a new point of view. And, and the movie was already great. So if the movie's already great, why do I just want to watch a version of the movie that has some songs in it? it, it there's, there's not a lot of reason for that. Uh, an, an example of that for me is the musical Ghost, which was on Broadway a few years ago and I saw it. I, to, to, for, in my opinion, they spent so much time trying to recreate every single moment of that movie, every special effect, you know, the pottery moment, because there are things that are iconic in people's minds about when you think about that movie. And they worked so hard to recreate those that they totally left out the heart. There's no heart in that. And when you watch the movie Ghost, your heart aches for those people, and you are completely committed to them trying to figure out how to get things to work. And I mean, it's, it, 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 it's a movie that will make you cry because it really affects your heart. The musical forgot about that and was working too much on that other stuff. On the other, and it only lasted four months on Broadway, um, Ghost. Beetlejuice, on the other hand, which I saw in 2018, I th what's interesting about Beetlejuice is that it deviates from the movie. It, it isn't faithful at all. It, it, it has a different way of telling the story. It has, it, 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 you know, it's true to the essence, but it is not true to the story. Which means if you love Beetlejuice, you could be mad, I guess. But on the other hand, you could go, oh, this is interesting. This is new. This is something I wouldn't have gotten from, from, the, from the movie. So this, there's a reason for me to see the movie and see the musical, because they're different. Uh, same thing with jukebox musicals. I think they're successful if they are careful to use the songs that they're using to tell a story and not simply string a bunch of songs together and throw some book in as an excuse to get from one song to the next. So I think they're much more successful if they actually, I think um, um, Mamma Mia is a really good example of that. Those are really popular songs, they could have just strung them together, but, they, but most of them they really made them meaningful in the storytelling and that's why I think that one works. Um, so, whether, you, whether you're doing a movie or a novel or a songbook or whatever, one of the problems is that if, if something is really, really popular, the odds are the rights are really, really expensive and you're not gonna get them. They're gonna be bought up by a producer and the producer is gonna hire a known team to write the show. But, so, you know, so that's another reason to go to adaptation, right? But that's why I say you shouldn't fret. Um, first of all, I think there's an unlimited uh, uh, source of of public domain material out there that's, that is free for you to use. And we actually have a whole 
you know, a whole section of our web website called the, um, the, uh, the ideas, the library of ideas that has lots of different source materials and there's tons out there. And, um, and so there's tons for you to, to adapt out there. And there are lesser known things that you can adapt. And, but more importantly, I think Broadway doesn't have to be your first goal. I'm not trying to tell you Broadway shouldn't be your goal. That's fine if it is. But it shouldn't be your first goal because the odds are very much against that. It has happened to a few people. Uh, but usually you're going to start somewhere else. You're going to write musicals that wind up in local theater, regional theater, and eventually you're going to write something that gets to Broadway. So think about that journey and realize that you don't have to be adapting a really popular movie or musical with your first musical. Um, and I think that's especially true now because, let's face it, throughout the history of this art form, musicals have largely been the purview of white men. That's just the way it's been. And I think that's likely to continue on Broadway to a large degree. But I think that there is a sea change happening at local and regional theater levels. Um, I think it was already happening sort of slowly, but I think COVID and all of the politics that have been happening over the last year or so have sped it up. I've been in many conversations, um, you know, Zoom conversations over the last year and a half or two years with um, fellow members of the National Alliance for Musical Theater, which is a service organization based in New York, and we're members, and, and most, most commercial producers, artistic directors, regional theater people who have anything to do with musicals belong to NAMT. And so um, I'm lucky enough to know a lot of them and be able to chat with them. And I've heard what they've been talking about for the last two years. And they've been talking about what they want to put on their stages once they can open them up again. And it doesn't look like what you're seeing on Broadway. Not at all. They're looking for more diversity. They're looking for diversity in their writing teams and in the stories that they're telling. Um, the proof of that for me is the lineup of the NAPT Festival this year. I don't know how many of you know about this festival. It happens every fall in October. It's one of the most prestigious festivals in the country because they only choose eight shows and they usually have two or three hundred submissions. They only choose eight and, um, oh boy, I'm going to run out of time here. Uh, okay, so I'll try to speed things up. They only choose eight and they get a, a, a showcase, a 40-minute showcase in front of, you know, 300 of the people in the industry who are actually looking for new musicals, so it's an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, I was on the selection committee that helped choose those eight shows for five or six years in the, I would say, around two, two, 2010 to 2015, I was on the selection committee. And the, the rule of thumb then was that we would, um, we would, uh, we had eight slots, and we, had to, we held one of those slots to put in what we called a diverse show. So the writers were black, the story was Asian, whatever it was, and we didn't have a lot to choose from. So it, it, they didn't have to reach the same level of craft as the other seven, but we had to get one in there. So, and I'm not saying that those shows weren't good necessarily, but we had to do that. That has completely changed now, and I saw it in last year's NAPT Festival, and I'll just quickly tell you the shows that are in this year's NAPT Festival. I'll try to do this fast. Um, Azul, which is by a Turkish, Latina, and Argentinian writer, and is, is Latin American music. Uh, Little Duende, which is uh, by a queer Mexican, and they describe their, their genre as Mexican mythos. Maya, which is by a writer from Singapore with music that fuses Western pop and Indian classical music. Missing Peace by Kyle Puccia and Kalani Capo. They don't say it on the site, but I happen to know they're both native, and their show was uh, developed at Native Voices in Los Angeles because I was their dramaturg, but they don't say anything about that on the site. Uh, Private Gomer Jones, which is based on the story of a deaf sniper. So it's about how, how, do, how do you tell the story of a deaf person in a musical? Really interesting. Uh, Senior Class, which is written by an African American and a South African writer and is an adaptation of My Fair Lady. Um, TLDR Thelma Louise Dyke remix in which T and L drive their convertible off the edge of a cliff and into a fantasy-driven, irreverent, queer rock musical. Uh, Fanny and Stella, which is written by, uh, partially by an artist known as Seven, S-E-V-A-N, who's described on the website as a two-time war refugee born and raised in the Middle East, enculturated in the African-American South, former expat in London, a polyglot actor, writer, singer, gamer, comic book reader, and disruptor of all things dominant culture related. Those are the eight shows. Things have changed. So does this mean that if you don't have the clout 
to get the rights to a big major adaptation, then you can only have success if you are non-white and non-male. Um, I think it does mean that the, stat the deck is no longer automatically stacked in your favor if you're a white male. Um, and I don't think that there's a reason to, I mean, there's a bit of a loss of privilege there that is a problem in, across all forms of culture these days, but there's no reason to whine about that. You just have to accept it and figure out a way around it. But neither, I think, is it a reason to assume that all doors are automatically going to open to you just because you're part of a previously underserved demographic. That doesn't mean all the doors will open. I think at the end of the day, you got to write a good musical that speaks to what the producers today think their audiences want, which isn't necessarily what they want, but what the producers think they want. And I think at the end of the day, what that means is you need a compelling story with high stakes that is really well crafted and authentically told, whatever that means. So uh, we're going to be talking about that a lot this season because I think it really changes a lot that's going on these days. And I think we need to learn how to tell these diverse stories of people who are black, Asian, Latinx, female, non-binary, non-conforming, transgender, asexual, demisexual, pansexual, deaf, blind, differently abled, and yes, even white and male. But we need to figure out how to put together the diverse writing teams that can tell those stories authentically.